So it's my pleasure today to introduce Dave Meacham, who is a professor at the Department of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, Dave works on cloud formation and cloud dynamics, which we're going to learn about today. Um, a lot of fluid dynamics stuff in there, which is good. Dave did his undergraduate at the University of Oklahoma, and then went to get his PhD at the University of Washington, Seattle, in atmospheric sciences. And then he went back to Oklahoma for postdoc and research positions, and he's been at KU as a professor since 2007. Um, so without further ado, uh, it's really nice to have people from different campuses, different departments here. I like the, doing this, so it's great to have Dave here. Thanks a lot. Okay. And why don't we get going? Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, and thanks for the hospitality. I've got to meet with a number of you today and had lunch with a subset of the grad students and uh, really, really have uh, enjoyed my, my day over here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about um, kind of a topic that's very sort of Newtonian, I guess, classical. Um, this idea of turbulent flows, and in particular what I like, um, the, kind of the center of my research, is clouds and, uh, and precipitation processes. Okay, so as far as a, kind of an outline, we'll talk a little bit about this sort of infamous question in the, in the, uh, in the title. Why do we care about clouds? Why are they such a challenge to, to deal with? Some of the research techniques that, that, uh, that we use to investigate them. A couple uh, sort of questions, a couple sort of foci of our recent uh, cloud and precipitation research. And then as I mentioned in the abstract, sort of a reluctant, reluctantly mention uh, the topic of geoengineering a little bit. Um, at the very, very end here. Okay, so I always start with some pretty cloud pictures, okay? So this is actually, so you look at the, the planet Earth, the pale blue dot, right? The first thing I always notice, maybe this is confirmation bias, but is the clouds. So clouds basically cover sort of on average about almost 70% of the, of the surface of the Earth. This is from the just launched uh, GOES-16 satellite in glorious Technicolor. Okay, um, so this is, I guess they're not releasing the data for actual scientific use yet, but for sort of purposes of marketing and pretty pictures, this is, this is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. So if you sort of spend any time doing, yeah? Do you think 70% Yes, on average. Yep, yep. So this is, no, this is a, this is a single hemispheric shot. So it's a geostationary, in a geostationary orbit. So yeah, this one is not a composite, it's just a kind of a single, single frame. Probably put together, I'm guessing over maybe 15 minutes of spin, scan, scan cycle, okay. Um, okay, so um, for those of us sort of raised on meteorology, sort of all we do is look at the clouds, so you can see all sorts of, you know, cloud animals, you can see, this is one of my favorites, this is my crocodile, kind of crocodile cloud, okay. Um, yeah, exactly. It's funny, funny. Fairly innocuous here. Um, so growing up, at, so a little bit of my sort of, a little bit of my background, I'm from central Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma City. So the reason um, atmospheric science is such a popular thing to study in this part of the country, frankly, is because of severe weather. Okay. And so this is a, a cloud too, right? This is a big supercell thunderstorm and then a tornado. Um, sort of zoom in. This is your mild-mannered colloquium speaker here. That's not a. That's truly not a mullet, right? It's. A, I'm actually. We're actually in like 35 knot sort of storm. Really strong storm inflow. Um, it's just making me look like I have a have a mullet. This fine. <laughs> this fine fellow is a well-regarded professor at University of North Dakota too. So. Um, anyway, so this is a, a pretty famous day. This is April 26, 91, taken to, uh, when I was an undergrad at OU. This is, for those of you that have been kind of around this part of the country, this was a storm kind of in northern Oklahoma, but this same day there was a storm that passed through Wichita and Andover, Kansas, and killed a bunch of people in Andover at a trailer, trailer park uh, there, sort of east of, uh, east of Wichita. Okay, so this is kind of from, from humble upbringings, uh, chasing tornadoes to doing low clouds, okay? So this is a high resolution um, satellite image of, of kind of coastal low clouds. So low clouds are gonna be the focus of what I'm talking about today and I'll sort of explain why here in a, um, here in a minute, okay? Okay, so I've done a lot over my kind of scientific, uh, scientific career, a lot of studying of marine clouds, okay? Particularly clouds here sort of across, in particular across the Pacific. So this is North America, South America. So if you take kind of a, a, a sort of cross-section across the Pacific from 
off either the coast of South America or the coast of North America, kind of westward and equatorward. And you kind of look at kind of the on average cloud conditions, you see something like this. So right next to the coast of, of Chile, right? I could draw the telescopes up here somewhere high, high altitude, right? Um, we have these low clouds, we call stratocumulus, sort of solid deck of, of, uh, of low clouds. And as you move over warmer and warmer waters, you move toward the tropics and, uh, um, and equatorward, the sort of clouds tend to deepen, they break up into what we call trade cumulus or shallow cumulus clouds. So we have these cloud regime transitions. As you move further and further west, okay, the war water gets warmer and warmer. The sort of warmest sea surface temperature on the planet is located over here in the Western Pacific warm pool region. And then you get sort of deep convective towers um, forming there. And as part of that, you have this sort of Hadley, kind of what we call the Hadley-Walker circulation. Upward motion here, what goes up must come down, so you have kind of compensating downward motion over here in the, in the uh, kind of stratocumulus and trade cumulus, uh, trade cumulus regime. So one of the things we're after is trying to understand, of course, the behavior of each individual cloud types, but also this kind of more holistically, this, uh, this transition here, okay? So I'm mainly going to talk about kind of two basic cloud types. One is the strat stratocumulus clouds. Okay, these are low clouds. These are about a kilometer or shallower. So this is from a field campaign in 2001. Um, this is from the kind of front, the flight deck of a C-130 looking sort of left and to the, uh, to the rear. You see these are kind of it's stratus, so it's layered, but it's cumulus because there's puffiness in here. And what these are, this is basically indic indicative of um, strong kind of turbulent flow. Okay. And then we can look at, I won't go too much into this, but this idea, so this is sort of a vertical cross section of the structure of these clouds. So it's sort of topped, this particular case is topped at about 850 meters. The cloud deck is about two or 300 meters deep. Um, and the main thing I wanna focus on now is that this is a boundary layer cloud. So when I talk about atmospheric boundary layer, it's the part of the atmospheric flow that's influenced by the surface. Okay, so there's a lot of sort of turbulence, what we'd call turbulence involved here. This is a turbulent, turbulent flow. And these clouds are kind of interesting. I mean, they look very sort of robust, but it turns out these clouds are kind of a delicate balance between a surface source of moisture coming off of the ocean surface, and then this sort of free troposphere up where the airplane is flying is very dry. And since this is sort of a turbulent cloud layer, you're sort of entraining this dry free tropospheric air into the cloud and trying to dry it out. So you have these two competing effects, this surface moisture source trying to sort of sustain the cloud and the entrainment trying to dry it out, right? And whichever one wins depends on, kind of sets the equilibrium cloud thickness or whether there's cloud um, there at all, okay? Okay, as you move a little bit further toward the west, toward warmer water, you get more broken clouds so that you get this kind of shallow cumulus cloud. It's easier for you up front maybe to see. There's a nice little rainbow here. Um, and it's actually, obviously because there's a rainbow here, it's precipitating, okay? And so these also have a certain thermodynamic structure. Down here, it's sort of well mixed and turbulent. Up here, it tends to be sort of less turbulent, okay? But you do have kind of strong, an updraft here moving upward and then mixing in environmental air from outside, outside of this cloud, okay? So I'm gonna kind of talk, kind of th this talk will sort of revolve around um, kind of both these cloud types. Okay, and this isn't contrary to what, um, what some of my colleagues in my own department believe. We're not just interested in this, these clouds because they take us to nice places, right? This is a coast of San, Di San Diego. Um, in fact, that, that, uh, that C-130 flight deck photo um, was from a field project where we were stationed at North Island Naval Air Station on Coronado. But these are typically kind of on west coasts and in kind of tropical regions, okay? So that's not the case, trust me. So why do we care about clouds, okay? And in particular, again, I'm focusing on low clouds, but you know, this could be more broadly you know, pitched as why we care about clouds just in general, okay? So high clouds and low clouds, 
affect the climate differently. Okay, obviously if you, you sort of look at these global pictures of clouds, you know they have incredibly high albedo, so they reflect, um, scatter back to space, a substantial amount of solar radiation. So this plot here is basically, on the x-axis is cloud optical depth, so you can just think of it sort of naively maybe as cloud thickness, so thicker cloud toward the right, and the y-axis is higher cloud top, okay? So if you look at just low clouds, they cool, right? All of them cool, thinner clouds cool less, thicker clouds cool more, okay? High clouds, and this may seem a little counterintuitive, but actually warm the climate quite a bit, okay? And this has to do with, yes, they cut down on the solar radiation entering the Earth system, okay? But they're also rather opaque to, uh, to the long wave, okay? Unless they're really thick. If they're really thick, then you can, uh, um, they can exert a cooling effect too. So we're down here, whether you get a lot of cooling or a little cooling kind of depends on cloud properties, the thickness of cloud, whether there's cloud present there at all. Okay, so this is extremely important for the global radiation balance um, that kind of dictates, dictates the climate. Okay, and it turns out that these low clouds are something that climate models really struggle with. Okay, so this is from a fairly recent, um, go ahead and see, knock these out, from a fairly recent kind of model bake-off, so a, sort of a bake-off between different um, GCM, so global climate models, off of the, sort of off the coast of South America. Okay, so this is, x-axis here is longitude, okay? So here is sort of right near the coast, here is out more toward the sea, and this is cloud top height, okay? So typically we expect that it's sort of warmer sea surface temperatures over on this side, so the kind of equilibrium cloud top height is gonna be deeper here, and you can see that they all, sort of all the models sort of get that trend right, but when you compare it to the observations, either the aircraft, which are these X's, or the ship, so the ship balloon launches from the ship, or the triangles, the models are basically, for the most part, underestimating the cloud depth, okay? So this translates then too to what we call liquid water path, which is basically a vertical integrative, inter integral of how much liquid water is in the column, okay? So the models tend to sort of under predict how much water is in the column, okay? And so this is, these are kind of geophysical quantities, but then when you do a radiative transfer calculation, you see that, that basically then it's going to, uh, um, basically going to uh, have a bias in the radiation, the shortwave radiation uh, uh, flux as well, okay? So these are something that the models still, still kind of struggle with. And so this seems to be a persistent problem. If you go back to the, what we call the, the the AR4 report, okay, you, you can just pull this out of the, of the working group one report. So cloud feedbacks, particularly low level cloud, are, 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 have been confirmed as a primary source of climate sensitivity, sensitivity differences. And then even the most recent one, the AR5, the fifth, an, fifth assessment report, this problem is still present, okay. Um, so this is kind of, kind of an issue we, that, that we struggle with. And so usually these are cast in terms of cloud feedbacks, okay? So this idea if you have some climate forcing, okay? You increase the CO2, maybe there's a certain amount of warming, so, and, and a certain amount of radiative forcing involved, and then the resulting temperature change, okay? Then the idea is, well, does this result in more clouds? fewer clouds or do the clouds stay the same, right? If there are more clouds present, that may sort of counteract some of that warming, some of that forcing, right? If there are fewer clouds, it may actually be an amplification effect, okay? So this is when we talk about cloud climate feedbacks, this is at least kind of qualitatively what we're, what we're referring to, okay? So what we, so the issue here is if we look at the feedback from the AR4, this 2007 report, okay? This feedback sort of parameters between zero and sort of two. The units here don't matter too much for watts per square meter per degree, okay? But you see that it's basically, not quite uniformly, but almost uniformly positive, but you see this huge sort of uncertainty band, right? And this is the C is for cloud. There's other feedback effects, so water vapor and albedo and lapse rate. We don't really care about these right now. So we see this positive run, okay? So then we you see this, you go write your proposals, imagine you're in, 2007, you go write your proposals and say, oh, we're going to try to improve, 
improve this, right, kind of hammer this uncertainty down, but then the most recent sort of AR5 report, and this has actually the cloud sort of broken up, but all we care about is the total cloud, and the uncertainty hasn't really gone down too much, okay? So, I mean, in the, I don't know, maybe in the, the words of, uh, of uh, somebody, is, you know, we're fired, or I don't know, but, but it seems like we need to be making better and perhaps quicker headway in, in, this, uh, in this issue, okay? So, I'm, what'd you say? Yeah, somewhat of a, slightly a different, yeah, somewhat of a different scale, right? So this is, but this is sort of zero to one and a half, and then sort of zero to one and a half. So, um, so yeah, I have these data sort of in a table, but it's, uh, it's gone down a teeny bit, but not as much as, for something that everybody knows is a problem, um, and that a lot of smart people are working on, we haven't made as much progress on this as, as I think we would have hoped. Right, right. There must be a lot of direct experimental contradictions associated with feedback. Yeah, it's, I mean, with, with uh, so these are typically, um, typically run for, you know, 100 years of, or 150 years, or sometimes even 1,000 years in order to kind of get these robust statistics. The problem with, obs I won't say problem with observations, the, with the observations, yeah, we have good data, but the difficulty is our observational record is quite short. And in addition to a po possible sort of, you know, anthropogenic signal that we're looking for, there's also a lot of background kind of waves kind of sloshing around like El Nino or the Pacific de Decadal Oscillation. So it's really a challenge um, with, with, the, uh, with the observations, um, with just the, the short observational record. Um, so yeah, but yes, I am just kind of showing the, the result from the, um, from, the different, uh, from the different models, okay? Okay, so we're looking at mainly short, short, or sorry, low clouds because uh, these tend to be what have been kind of fingered as being the most important um, kind of component of the cloud, the, the cloud problem, okay? So what we do, so my group tends to, um, we don't run climate models ourselves. We have run some regional climate models looking at, at some, uh, some kind of central US kind of regional climate questions. But on the cloud side of things, predominantly what we do is to sort of take a step back behind the front lines a little bit and sort of acknowledging that the models kind of struggle with these, uh, with representing the clouds. So what we do is try to seek um, improving the fundamental knowledge of how cloud and precipitation processes work, okay, across a variety of scales, and then figuring out better ways to resolve them, or to, sorry, represent them in climate models. Okay, climate models have sort of an effective grid spacing of maybe a degree of latitude, so maybe a box uh, with grid points maybe every 100 kilometers or so, and you know if you've ever stepped outside, you know, a typical cloud, even a big thunderstorm is going to be much smaller than that. So it's a subgrid scale process that has to be modeled or kind of in, the, in our jargon parameterized. Okay? So figuring out improved parameterizations is kind of the ultimate goal of, our, uh, of what we do. Okay? Okay, so when we take a, I'm talking about clouds a lot, but really this is a fundamentally a, a kind of multi-phase problem. Okay, so in order to get clouds, okay, you have to get, in order to get condensation at kind of atmospheric, uh, at sort of reasonable levels of atmospheric uh, uh, relative humidity, you have to have aerosol particles present, okay, specifically soluble kind of cloud condensation nuclei. When you do that, you can get cloud liquid droplets. Depending on the makeup of the, of the cloud droplets, okay, you can get them sort of colliding with each other and forming precipitation sized droplets. And when you do that, that actually can tend to sort of deplete or diminish the, um, the aerosol population, right? So you have sort of a very much a, a kind of interactive, um, interactive process, process going on. So when you're thinking about modeling these clouds or representing them numerically, um, or even sort of sampling them observationally, you have to kind of think in this, this whole, uh, this whole uh, think of all of these three different, uh, um, kind of three different populations, basically. Okay. Okay. And 
we have to sort of realize that, that um, these flows, predominantly they're low clouds, so they're close to the Earth's surface, and so these are part of or embedded in a uh, turbulent boundary layer flow, okay? And so sort of we have to, you, you can't really think about these clouds without sort of embracing fluid dynamics and, and, and uh, thinking about turbulence. And so when we talk about atmospheric flows, you know, when we talk about fluid dynamics, you're going to get a different sort of a different response, whether you talk to, to an atmospheric scientist or an oceanographer, somebody doing aerospace engineering, somebody doing um, chemical or mechanical engineering, you know, where they do a lot of sort of what I call, what I say to my students is molasses in a pipe, sort of viscosity driven type flows. Um, or maybe somebody, you know, uh, people in this department doing uh, plasma kind of physics, okay. So atmospheric flows tend to be predominantly driv driven by pressure gradients. We usually think of them as sort of, well, this is a buoyancy driven turbulence or this is shear driven, okay? But kind of fundamentally, it all comes down to pressure gradients. Um, we're dealing with high Reynolds number of flows. So these are flows um, dominated not by viscosity, but by turbulence. Rotation can be important. So we frame our equations in a non-inertial reference frame. So we have Coriolis and centrifugal. So hopefully nobody you know, keels over when I say that. Okay. So I have, a, I have a daughter in high school physics, and she, you know, they basically say, no, centrifugal force is not real. Okay. But you know, it's still on the right-hand side of our, of our equations. Okay. And then atmospheric stratification or stability can be important in, uh, in sort of determining the nature of the turbulence. And this is what I was talking about before. When we talk about multi-phase flows, we mean there's gases. There's aerosol particles of various sizes, shapes, hygroscopicity, sort of chemical processes, droplets of various sizes, so full sort of spectra of droplets, maybe ice crystals of various sizes and, uh, and uh, ice crystal habits or shapes that we call them. Okay? So we have to deal sort of ideally with all of these with sort of one caveat. I'm kind of a weenie and ice scares me and I deal mostly with low clouds, so we don't worry about ice. It's really complicated because the kind of crystal type you get is very dependent on temperature and supersaturation. So we're not going to, this is really cool, but we're not going to worry about this because it frightens me. Okay? Okay. I have done some of it in the past when I dealt with more with deep tropical stuff, but yeah, for right now, I'm, I'm kind of scared of it. Um, when we talk about observationalists, I'll, I'll sort of give the disclaimer first that, that, uh, my, back, my, my upbringing sort of um, is much more kind of computational, on the computational side. So I'm more of a, a modeler, okay? But more and more I've been sort of dragged into working with, with, uh, with the observations, okay? You know, it's, you've got to stick your head out the window. And, and also the other reason is, you know, models have started, you can make some really great visualizations with models. And a lot of times they look so good that you can fool yourself into thinking that that's reality, okay? And that's something I caution my students all the time against, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's something, it's a, it's a minefield we have to be sort of wary of, okay? So when we talk about observations, there's sort of a number of different um, uh, observation, sort of observational platforms we use. I have this ship here. I w wasn't on the ship, but you can get sort of measure exchanges of heat and water, um, and various chemical constituents between the surface and the, and the atmosphere on the ship. For me, the important thing of the ship is that it's a platform to launch soundings, okay, balloon launches. I mean, it seems really odd that it's, you know, 2017 and this is still sort of old-fashioned balloon launches, and these are all radio telemetered back, but these are still like gold, and they're actually surprisingly, they're very expensive still. Um, and you basically measure temperature, pressure, humidity, and then you track them to, 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 to get the wind. Okay, so any field campaign, you try to get as many of these as the funding agency will, will pay for. Okay, um, what I'm really into, and this is because of an involvement with the uh, Brookhaven National Lab, and, uh, which is one of the DOE labs, um, is surface-based remote sensing. So I'm particularly in love with radar. So this is a kind of an old-fashioned kind of scanning precipitation radar, but what I really love are these uh, high frequency cloud radar. So this is like a 35 gigahertz, this is 95 gigahertz um, cloud radar. So they're sensitive enough to pick up cloud size droplets, like 10 micron size droplets, and they're all Doppler. So they can measure the um, velocity sort of toward and away from, of the scatterers. So these are profiling instruments, so they basically just 
scan every couple seconds to see what's, um, what's above it. And then a couple other instruments, so LIDARs that can kind of give you information about cloud boundaries, and then microwave radiometers, which are sort of two or three channel instruments that, uh, um, that kind of give you information about the microwave uh, brightness temperatures, and from that you can, uh, you can sort of back out or retrieve sort of integrated, like how much water vapor is in the column and how much liquid water is in the column. And then satellite stuff. I, don't, I tend to not use satellite a whole lot, um, but more and more, again, I'm kind of being dragged in that, um, in that direction. Okay. So here's just an example from a kind of paper we did a few years ago of some of these radar, um, radar observations. So this is, these radars are placed in this DOE sort of core site in northern Oklahoma. You wouldn't think northern Oklahoma is a, maybe a mecca for climate and atmospheric research, but there's a millions, tens of millions of dollars of instruments there at the, at the, uh, the ARM site there. Um, and so what this is, this is kind of think of this as a time, remember it's a profiling instrument, so this is a time height sort of measurement, and you can see kind of quite a bit, and this is a kind of weather system that's passed through, and then there are this kind of, this kind of big cloud patch behind the weather system, and then, but you see here this nice kind of low cloud, the cloud top here is around one kilometer, okay, and it's sustained for hours and hours and hours. Okay, one reason I got hooked on this, I was down, living down in Norman and sort of actually noticed this, and most of these low clouds uh, have been studied over the ocean, so it's kind of fun to catch one over, uh, catch one this sort of robust over the, uh, over the land, okay? And this quantity that's being plotted is this sort of wacky um, quantity called radar reflectivity, which is actually, it's like if you look at the weather, um, like in severe weather season when it's on the, on the TV, that's usually what's plotted. Um, and it's, it's proportional to the sixth, um, Sixth power of the drop size. Okay, so it's very sensitive to to uh, um, to a few large droplets. So this is kind of zoomed in on the zero to or the six to twelve um, sort of six hours of this time period. So you see this cloud, and this is the Doppler information. So red means up, blue means down. Okay, so from this you can back out turbulent information. Okay, you can get turbulent dissipation rates. You can get um, vertical velocity variance and skewness. All sorts of sort of Stuff that's gold and kind of the fluid dynamics, uh, fluid dynamics realm. Okay, so it's so it, so it's pointed upward. So it's just a pure timing, it's a timing thing. thing. Yep, 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 yep. So it's sending pulses out. It's sending pulses out and then waiting and then listening for them to come back, and then that's how it gets the timing. Is how it gets this, and then the phase shift is how it gets the the sort of Doppler velocity information. Yep. And then so for, for a case like this where it's basically non-precipitating, right, the clouds are just kind of moving around, the cloud droplets are moving around with the moving along in the flow, it's great, okay. Um, once they get a little bigger, if you have precipitation, right, then you have them sort of blowing around in the flow but then sort of falling. And so you, then the, the sort of velocity information kind of contains those, both of those effects and you have to sort of parse them, pull them apart, which is not, not easy, okay. So also sometimes we do, I just want to show this briefly, use particle probe data from aircraft. You go and just like literally fly through the airplane and you get sort of droplet spectral information. So like, like this kind of plot, I'll just, just kind of show you this one. So this is droplet diameter and number concentrations. So number concentration is a function of diameter. This is a pretty typical, you'll a lot of times see a cloud mode and then a sort of precip mode, okay? So we use this some, not, not, um, not regularly, but we use these data every once in a while. I usually rely on people. It's, you have to be careful and not just sort of pull down all these data and use them. There's a lot of kind of instrument sort of uh, black art associated with using these data in a smart way. Okay. Oopsie. Okay. So now I want to talk about kind of what my, is my bread and butter uh, numerical simulation. Okay. And oopsie. And so this is all, it's a particular flavor of numerical simulation. We use a wide variety of models. What I want to talk to you today, though, about is what's called large eddy simulation. So this is very popular in um, meteorology and also in various, um, various parts of engineering, okay? So it's based on this. It's sort of, so what's plotted here is basically for a turbulent flow, it's, it's essentially a power spectrum. So you can, you can make a power spectrum of, like, pick any one of the sort of momentum components if you want, make a power spectrum of it, 
And what you see is you see a sort of peak in the spectrum that happens at a certain scale. It's usually it's kind of determined by the, by the sort of geometry of, the, of, of your setup. Okay, and energy is sort of pumped into the turbulence down here at, um, at larger scales. So I should say this, this is a function of wave number. So right, smaller scales to the, to the right. So we're put, pumping energy into the system down here at larger scales, smaller wave numbers. These are very anisotropic eddies, right? So they're, they're kind of, the eddies are determined kind of by the geometry of the, of the situation of the boundary layer or whatever kind of physical setup you have. And then once you have this peak of energy and then you have this sort of downscale energy cascade, okay? This is like every almost every turbulent flow you look at will have some kind of kind of behavior like this. Um, and the, the kind of standard source for this is, uh, is Kolmogorov, right? The kind of classical turbulence, kind of minus K to the minus 5 thirds turbulent theory. So a model ideally, you know, if you think, oh, I've got to make a model, right? It has to resolve all of this, okay? Which is a bit terrifying. These are large wave numbers in very small scales. And this is down to scales of like molecular viscosity, which in the atmosphere, you know, like millimeter size, right? So we're not going to be able to run our cloud model at millimeter grid spacings, okay? So what we do is this idea of called large eddy simulation. We pick somewhere around here where this power spectrum is nice and kind of evenly sloped, and we sort of say, we do a basically low pass filter on the flow, okay? And we say, okay, we're gonna try to resolve all this weird, difficult, anisotropic stuff, and this over here, we're not gonna resolve it, we're gonna try to model it somehow. Okay. And then hope that, okay, well, it's nice and kind of isotropic and sort of easy. We should be able to, to model it. So this is sort of the basis of what's called uh, large eddy simulation. Okay, I won't go to, I mean, I have some equations here, but I mainly want to just kind of um, show sort of, what we're, sort of what we're up against. So this is the, these are all Navier-Stokes equations. This is, this is the momentum equation. If you want to quibble and say, that's not momentum, that's U. So this is sort of U is one, two, three for the three components of the flow. And then I've left out the summation. We summation over the, the J's, okay? So kind of typical tensor kind of notation. So I just want to show you sort of, for those of you either who haven't seen or are rusty on kind of fluid dynamics, just the different terms. So this is the local time rate of change. This is what we call advection. Some people call this convection. Convection is reserved for something different in, in uh, meteorology and oceanography, but this is basically the flow moving itself around, right? This is old friend with pressure gradient. This, you can probably guess, is gravity, okay? We call these forces, but in, when you do fluids, you express forces in terms of per unit mass, so the forces are really acceleration, okay? This makes our students angry, but, um, but uh, um, this is, okay, we're doing this in a, as I mentioned, in, a, in our non-inertial reference frame, okay, because we're down here on the rotating Earth, so we have to sort of accept that. So this is Coriolis, and this is molecular viscosity, okay? So now we do is do a low-pass filter on, on this. If you read the kind of classical, like, mechanical engineering literature on LES, they're really careful about how they formulate this. We're a little more sloppy. We sort of kind of do a Reynolds averaging kind of procedure, you split everything up into sort of a, an average quantity and then sort of a perturbation quantity, and then you get sort of the filtered, filtered equation. So everything's barred, right? This is the fil these are all the filtered quantities, except this term over here, okay? What we do, we throw out the viscosity, okay? Most of our numeric, numerical schemes are dissipative enough that we can eh, just not worry about that. And uh, see what I mean when I say it's a little sloppy. And then this was the term for the kind of high frequency components of the flow that we can't ignore, right? We have to figure out a way to model them in terms of what we know. So usually what we do is something based on like basically what K theory, this idea that the flux is proportional to the sort of gradient of the mean, okay? Okay, so this is basically what people spend careers on that I've sort of, I've sort of reduced down to one slide, so sorry people. Um, but, uh, and, and again, we're a little bit, um, a little bit flippant about, about the formalisms. Um, but, yes? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I hope not. <laughs> what? Where? 
Oh, sorry. So this is the, the kind of cyclical sort of IJK, just the standard kind of tensor no, notation. So this is a cross product. This is basically omega cross u. So. Three dimensions. Three dimensions, yeah. And the main reason you can do it in two, and some people do it in two, but turbulence doesn't cascade. The energy, when you do two-dimensional flow, um, the energy cascades sort of the wrong way in two-dimensional turbulence. So yeah, it basically, I mean, you can do it in two, but it's not, it, it doesn't represent, it's not a really good representative, a representation of the flow. Okay. Okay, I'm not really gonna talk about the, the numerics, but the idea here is we have conservation laws, right? This is the momentum. We do the same thing for mass continuity, right? We have to conserve mass. I don't know, not all the physicists need to conserve mass, but we absolutely have to. And then like first law of thermodynamics, conservation of total water, whatever chemistry you wanna, Chemi chemical substances you want. Um, so we have these equations, and then you know you go talk to the applied math people and figure out how to represent, how to discretize them or solve them uh, numerically. I'm not really gonna go into this too much. I do wanna talk a little bit about, so that was sort of the flow part, right? Again, this is a multi-phase problem. I wanna talk a little bit about microphysics. So this is cloud, like droplet growth and precipitation process. I'm gonna sort of reduce my whole career down to one sort of slide with no formulas or pretty pictures. Okay, we have to represent, if we're going to do clouds in the model, we have to re represent nucleation of droplets. Right? So we have to have some aerosol and figure out how those aerosol nucleate droplets. We have condensational growth of the small droplets up to kind of cloud sized droplets. We have coalescence, right? They wanna be, some, sometimes they wanna be gregarious and get together and coalesce. If they're big enough, we may have drop, droplet breakup and then maybe evaporation. Okay, and there are various philosophies ranging, I don't have this ordered very well, but ranging from like super simple to sort of less simple to very complex. We do a lot of sort of size resolving microphysics, so at every point in the model, we try to represent the actual drop size distribution. Um, so this is what, kind of what we, what we try to do. Okay, so we do fluid, fluid prop, prop, or, uh, kind of fluid flow problems. We get a lot of kind of, kind of uh, questions from the IT people say, saying, oh, you know, you can just do it on the cloud, man. But this stuff, this is all the fluid flow problems, whether it's us or people in aerospace, you have to have kind of a traditional, still a traditional kind of cluster with a high-speed interconnect. So there's a lot of kind of CS, kind of parallel computing component to, uh, um, to what we do. So here's just sort of a pretty, let's see if I can do this, a pretty picture like to fool ourselves into like thinking. So this is kind of, kind of a fake pseudo albedo. So looking down on the cloud field, you can see them kind of bubbling up and then detraining and then maybe sort of kind of dissipating. And then you can see a lot of times new clouds will form in the vicinity of old clouds. Um, so this, I just think it, this, is, this is actually a little bit old. I could come up with a kind of newer, prettier picture more re with you know, higher resolution, but I still kind of, kind of like it. I'm sorry, these are doubly periodic. So yeah, these are periodic boundary conditions. So like what goes out one side comes in the, comes in the other. Yeah. Most like typical LESs, not all LESs, but typical LESs do, do uh, um, use periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so a couple sort of applications in kind of, kind of uh, moving to applications. I wanna talk about a couple things that we've looked at. So this is from, uh, from a study we did a, uh, several years ago with uh, collaborators at uh, North Carolina State and Oregon State. Um, and this idea in the community, and I was talking to, uh, um, talking to a, couple of you about, a couple of you about, in the kind of meteorological community or the cloud community, there's sort of this battle between, well, what kind of, what's the kind of controlling factor in cloud and precipitation processes? Is it more kind of the meteorology or the large scale dynamics, or is it sort of aerosol influences, okay? And so this is kind of an ongoing question. So we kind of ask this question, pose the question this way, what factors are kind of ultimately determine um, cloud properties, okay? Um, so the idea, yeah, which is more important, basically. We've tried to boil it down into this kind of uh, sort of binary solution set in some, some sense. Is it aerosols or meteorology, okay? And so they're, they're, they're sort of plausible mechanisms for either to, to, to kind of, um, sort of act this way. So if you have fewer aerosols, so if it's cleaner, right, less polluted, then when you have condensation for a given amount of condensate, the droplets are gonna be fewer and they're gonna be larger, okay? Fewer, larger droplets tend to have greater collision efficiency and 
and make for sort of more efficient precipitation production, which then may sort of rain out. You may lose the cloud that way, okay? All right? So the sort of meteorologic or meteorology argument is that if you have deeper moisture cloud, you may have more liquid water, so bigger cloud droplets, and then greater precipitation production. Okay, so the idea is which one of these is sort of dominant, okay? And so this is always a danger with modelers. There are, there are a lot of studies out there where they'll do, they'll test the aerosol sensitivity and they'll do like 100, or 100 versus 1,000, right? You can always sort of cook the books that way when you do models, right? This is the whole beauty of models. It's the way we do controlled sort of, it's in, in meteorology, it's the only way we have sort of true experimental control. It's sort of our lab, okay? Um, so what we do, though, is have everything the same, but vary, in this case, vary sort of the meteorology, in this case, how deep is the cloud, okay? And we vary the aerosol, which we call CCN is cloud condensation nuclei, it's sort of the cloud active aerosol. So we vary the aerosol, okay? But we do it, we wanna be very careful and do it in such a way that's observationally constrained, okay? So we kind of constrain this variation based on the observed distributions of these quantities from a, from a nice field campaign that took place it's, back it's in 2008. The top, the top is actually data, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are, these are observations from the ship off of the coast of, of South America. So these are how we sort of constrain our change, our parameter changes for our sensitivity experiments. Okay, because otherwise you can kind of cook the books and make, make, sort of make whatever you want. Okay, so this is just the, we produce sort of, this is a, like a kind of, this is model. Okay, this is sort of a, looks like a radar, kind of radar image, and it produces nice vertical slices that sort of look like, the, look like the cloud radar. And what we've shown that, what we've shown is, it kind of produced what was basically in line with our, our hypothesis, this idea that, okay, the, the sort of deeper clouds precipitate, more, the shallow ones precipitate yet less, okay? But it turns out the main difference of adding in extra aerosol is not that it sort of shuts down the precip, but it basically just kind of delays the onset. So this is a bit of a kind of surprising result, but I think it's, 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 it's largely in line with our, um, with, our, uh, with our hypothesis. And as I mentioned, this is kind of an area of ongoing research with kind of two sort of sub-communities kind of bad, I mean, fairly nicely, but battling, um, battling it out a little bit, okay? So another um, sort of issue that I wanna briefly talk about is, is, so precipitation is important in these clouds. It's important in terms of the water budget, right? If you have precipitation, you can rain the cloud out and there'll be no cloud, okay? Um, and we talk about precipitation, I'm talking about precip rates that are like a millimeter per day. That's sort of moderate, okay? That's not exactly sort of Noah's Ark kind of <laughs> magnitudes, right? Um, but for these clouds, both in terms of the water budget and in terms of sort of energetics, it's, it's actually quite important. So kind of one of the holy grails is sort of trying to figure out what governs precipitation onset, like the earliest stages of precipitation in these clouds. So I have a master's student, or a student that she just finished her master's, and this is a paper basically that's about, so it's sort of in, in prep, I guess, um, to, to sort of look at this, okay? Um, and so this idea that we've kind of cast it like this, so she's done these high resolution, a, a really nice high resolution, one of these nice high resolution simulations, and then went in identified regions of precipitation initiation, okay? Then what she's done is taken back trajectories, right? Calculated back trajectories to figure out where that air comes from and look at the sort of cloudy, the, the sort of cloud variables and atmospheric variables along those back trajectories to look at precursor conditions, okay? The idea, our hypothesis being that we expect sort of these these uh, sort of new precipitation cells to be sort of more associated with larger values of liquid water content, okay, as opposed to being sort of anomalously clean, okay? So you could kind of, in theory, given the mechanism I was talking about earlier, you could get it either way. So for a given amount of liquid water content, um, you can either, uh, you can kind of get it, you can get large droplet sort of radii either, either way, okay? So this was our hypothesis. So she did this, kind of, this is the steps I just talked about. She identified these regions. 
She also identified some control regions where there was no um, precipitation initiation, did lots of back trajectories for each region, and then basically looked at the statistics for, uh, um, for each of those. Okay? And what we found actually surprised us a little bit. This is sort of what it looks like. This is, a, again, a kind of cr horizontal cross-section of this sort of unbroken cloud field. But you can see it's somewhat variable. But these vertical slices, so this is the cloud. This is actually a fairly deep cloud. It's up to about 1.6 kilometers. So this is sort of what she identified a initial sort of precip region here, and then we did back trajectories. She's not plotted all 1,000 of them. You plot back trajectories, so this is that wacky radar reflectivity quantity. This is cloud water, so this is the content of droplets less than 25 microns. This is the sort of liquid water content of droplets greater than 25 microns, and this is a droplet concentration. And then what we do is make PDFs sort of of all these quantities, okay? And so this is a bit of the surprising result. So we have PDFs of you know, whatever you want. This is mean droplet radius. This is sort of the cloud water content. And this is the droplet concentration. So our thought was that, OK, these for the P, for the precipitating um, regions, the cloud water is going to be greater than the red. Then it's actually quite opposite. OK, so whoops, sorry. Did you meant to say something? It's counterintuitive for us. I mean, for us, I think it's, and this is sort of a, I won't say it's a deep paradox, but it's something we have to resolve. Yeah. I, I suspect the way you, way you thought that uh, indeed your red side has to be probably heavier uh, compared to your red. How do you identify the magma side to be that the uh, mesh? Mesh, that's not uniform. Right. So, well, so. I mean, that's kind of an interesting, this is a very much a multi-scale problem. These, the, but you're right, the, for, the, for the kind of fluid part of the problem, the, the LES, the grid spacing is about 100 meters, or maybe 50. Um, but at each point, we resolve the drop size distribution, which are kind of, that's basically a function of microns, right? So different sort of micron sizes of droplets. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I still think, I don't think it's inconsistent. I mean, I think it's, you solve sort of, the, each has sort of its own scale, I guess, in some sense. You're doing the, with the drop size distribution, you're doing what's called the stochastic collection equation, basically looking at the interaction of each bin with the other bins to figure out where you have the mass loss and mass gain to, to predict the evolution of the drop size distribution. And I think fundamentally you can do that and have a sort of scale of the or grid spacing of the fluid flow be different. I don't think that's in, that's, that, I think that can be consistent. I don't think that's a problem. Um, but that is a good sort of point to always kind of think that this is a pretty, uh, kind of a pretty multi-scale, multi-scale problem, okay? So this has been rather, sort of rather perplexing. We've checked, we've, we've, we've gone at this many different ways to look at the kind of, make sure that we're doing this right with different independent kind of calculations. And it seems like quite a robust, uh, quite a robust uh, kind, of, kind of outcome. One of the things, I'm not sure it's entirely, so, so what we're trying to do is then, it, it sort of, at least on the surface, seems not consistent with the previous results, our previous work that we were talking about. I suspect that um, these are just early stages of precipitation initiation. I suspect if you were to take this and sort of integrate forward, you've sort of forward trajectories, which is actually quite a bit more difficult, um, that, um, that those, the ones that ultimately produce robust precipitation cells will eventually have to pass through regions with la large liquid water content, okay? The forward problem, the sort of forward calculation is harder because then you start to get into precipitation size particles and then you have to, like, what are you following? Are you following the air motion? Are you following the droplets? And then the different size droplets fall at different rates, so you get sort of si what's called size sorting. So it becomes really complicated um, really quickly, okay? So this is something we're, we're working on in collaboration with some uh, colleagues at NASA GIS in uh, New York City, okay? Okay, so this is just kind of a couple, kind of a few, uh, a uh, couple examples of what we do. We do, we do, there are other projects we're working on as well, but I thought this would be, this is, these are kind of, kind of hot off the press in some sense. Okay, I want to talk briefly, I said reluctantly talk about geoengineering. Um, just want to talk a little bit about this. Um, this sort of efforts in the, in the kind of uh, face of global climate change, okay, to, um, to 
evaluate what I'm calling the efficacy, feasibility, and then consequences, particularly what we're after is unintended consequences of modifying the global radiation balance. Okay, so three that, that seem most kind of close, closely tied to the cloud problem, especially the, the second two, um, we'll wrap it up here in a couple minutes, is, uh, is sort of space mirrors, um, stratospheric sulfate, and, uh, and kind of in cloud brightening. And this, I'm just going to really sort of briefly, briefly talk about these in case you haven't seen it. This is a subject of a, a philosophical transitions from a, from a um, couple years ago. So this is, uh, these are actually what are called ship tracks. So these are low, um, low clouds sort of with the cloud droplets nucleated by particles from, from ships. Okay. From the, from the pollution of the ships? Yeah, from the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there, I mean, it's not, I mean, it, yeah, it's from the effluent of the, yeah, from the exhaust from the ship providing um, nuclei to, sufficient nuclei to nucleate droplets. Yeah? If I was in the Navy, I wouldn't like Yes, right, yeah, exactly, right? So that's why, that's why you push for nuclear-powered ships, right? They, they, there you have heat, perhaps heat uh, release, but at least not, uh, not combustion kind of products. Exactly. So this is what, when I think solar radiation management, this is always what comes to mind. I always tell my students, and they don't quite get it, that my, my inner monologue is sort of half Simpsons, half Arrested Development, which is a sort of early 2000s <laughs> show. Um, so, that, I mean, this is all, even the Arrested Development is almost sort of before their, their, their time. Um, but this is sort of the solar, the, the sort of Montgomery Burns version of solar radiation management. Um, and then I just want to talk about, this is, this is sort of this stratospheric injection, which sort of volcanoes do this naturally, right? They inject sulfates and all sorts of other junk into the stratosphere, and they can produce sort of a, an, an actual cooling, sort of an observed cooling signal. So one of the proposals, and this is by a British group, um, was, is to sort of put um, balloons up in the stratosphere and, uh, and release sulfate aerosols, which one of the side effects is sort of sky brightening, and I can just see anybody doing sort of land-based astronomy is just like, oh my gosh, why would you ever want to do this, right? Because it's sort of scattering, backscattering radiation, not just solar radiation, but radiation from anything you're interested, sort of back to, back to space. Uh, the proponents of this argue that, you know, if you inject this fairly low in the stratosphere, it's fairly short-lived, so, you know, you can shut it off if, if need be. Okay, and this is fundamentally, they view this as fundamentally different than sort of releasing sulfates into the, into the troposphere, which a lot of times have been, sort of this is the root of the old sort of 70s uh, acid rain problem. Okay. So what's the trans, how much of the fruits of the atmosphere change can you do? 5%, 10%, 1%? Yeah, like 1% to 2%. Uh, so to okay, okay, okay. I figured it would be like, like... I mean, it's sort of like, oh gosh, really? And, and like whitening, just the like talking about the whitening of the sky is just seems like bad, but okay, one to two percent, maybe it's not bad. Um, so this is the other sort of idea as far as if we're talking about low clouds, is having these arrays of ships, sort of autonomous ships out over the ocean. And I don't know what the, uh, maybe they're supposed to be nuclear powered or something, which seems like its own maybe issue. But all these do, there's really strong sort of turbines, jet turbines in there that, oops, sorry, that, that spew seawater, right? This is just seawater that's spewing up into the atmosphere, right? The droplets evaporate and you're left with small sea salt nuclei that can serve as cloud condensation nuclei, aerosol to nucleate droplets. And the idea here is to sort of artificially brighten the clouds that are already there. Okay, this one is really thought to be sort of innocuous, okay, in that you can just shut these off and the lifetime of these aerosol is, you know, on the order of a day, a couple days. Um, and so this is, I don't know that this has gotten serious traction, but this is something that, that people are, are, are thinking about. One sort of... So, yeah, this is all sodium chlorides. Yeah, this is straight, well, whatever's in the seawater, but yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, sodium, sodium chloride. And I mean, they can, I think they figure out ways to sort of... Um, tune the size of the particles. You don't want big particles because big particles would actually make the clouds tend to precipitate more. So what you want to put up is like submicron size, size um, chunks of salt up in, uh, up in the air. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, so that's a, th what'd you say? So, so they have done that, and sort of the, the, the problem when you do, at least for this kind of, you know, these, 
these dynamical systems, um, these kind of coupled dynamical systems, you do a sort of back of the envelope calculation and yeah, you can say, okay, well it, 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 it uh, sort of enhances the backscatter of solar radiation by a certain percent that actually seems maybe substantial. You can get quite, I mean, you can see from the cloud, from the, uh, from those ship tracks that it, it actually brightens the cloud, can brighten the cloud considerably, or if there's no cloud, it can actually make cloud, okay? So the downside, or the, the, the sort of cautionary part is it's not just a sort of partial derivative, deradiation, D dN, D you know, holding cloud thickness the same or something. There's feedbacks involved, okay? And there's, a, there's feedbacks with precipitation, there's feedbacks in entrainment, and there are a couple papers that have found that if you do try this cloud brightening, there's sort of a, a feedback where you get cloud thinning, which sort of acts the other way. So it's not, it doesn't just sort of all act in the same way. There's sort of these what are called buffer, what have been referred to in literature as sort of buffering effects. Okay, so you perturb a system, but you don't get the outcome that you might expect just from basic sort of linearization. Okay. Okay, so I want to just kind of talk about this and, and sort of, sort of, if you've, if you've seen these or heard of these, it's great. If not, you kind of know what some people are kind of out there, out there thinking. I always worry about unintended consequences, but, um, but these are some things that people have been, have been thinking about. Um, so I'll just leave these sort of concluding summaries on the board. And I want to thank everybody again. Thank you all again for having me over here. It's been, it's been fun. So. so we have time for some questions. Yeah, right. So it's all, uh, you, you want the incoming and out. Well, right now, because we've, we've sort of increased the emissivity by cranking up the CO2, right now there's, there's sort of more incoming than there is outgoing because we're not at equilibrium. So, so this is something that the satellites can measure. Yeah, you look at, you look at sort of mostly incoming short wave, mostly out, outgoing long wave. Um, and and uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, kind of ultimately what's, what's important is the, the kind of sum of all of these different, all of the different effects of the individual cloud ensembles. But in some sense, you have to get those right to get the, to get the total, to get everything right, the total right. <laughs> You have these models where you try and select random models many times you have these sort of um, thick clouds, you get a bunch of thick clouds, this is a bunch of these clouds. But if you had enough like data, couldn't you like select like real data types? Right, right. So this is I mean this is this is why you want this is why DOE has been taking long term long term observations now for for, I mean, almost 30 years, and why, why we have a long-term satellite record. The problem is it's such a multi-parameter, a multivariate problem, it's really hard to get any experimental control. I mean, you use Tritis Bayesian methods or conditional sampling, but you never have as much data as you really need to, to kind of, to, to isolate the influence of specific, sort of specific variables. So this is, I mean, you do it anyway, but, but it's, uh, this is why, I mean, sort of my worldview is that you have this sort of relationship of both having observations and modeling. And, and the trend now is to move towards some kind of data assimilation, kind of, uh, which is something that's been done in the sort of meteorology community for the longest time to get, improve your weather forecast. But that's kind of a hybrid way of sort of blending these two kind of data sources. And I hesitate, like, like observationalists really hate calling models data, or some people are really kind of, Get, that makes them really upset, but. Barb? I wanted to ask about contrails, because I remember that they're typically a pretty big fraction of the cloud cover, but I don't know where they are in altitude, and I don't know where they fit into this feedback picture that you've described. Right, so, so contrails are up in the stratosphere, so, um, you know, in terms of like 40,000 feet, sort of roughly speaking, and, uh, um, so up, yeah, upper troposphere, stratosphere, they fit up in the sort of, if you look back, I'm not gonna flip back, but in that sort of thickness and height, cloud top height plot, they're a warming effect for the climate because largely they let quite a bit of solar radiation through, but because they emit in the, it, it's sort of cold temperatures, um, yeah, they're a net sort of warming on the, so if you, I mean, if you could get rid of all of the contrails, you might help some, but it's a, could you change the Earth's activity of the contrails? I mean, if we're just 
stuff Yeah, right. Um, it's, you know, it's not clear. So those are a little different because those are ice. Those are going to be sort of instantly sort of ice particles. And, uh, and I don't, yeah, it's not obvious to me how you do it. I don't think you can get rid of them altogether unless you sort of change the, unless you have some kind of combustion that doesn't have water vapor as the, as a sort of outcome of the combustion. Black food coloring in that. <laughs> you did what? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the problem. The problem is, and, and I forget that, that there was some like GRL, uh, ge geographical or uh, geophysical research letters paper on that, but it's just it's just statistically not there wasn't it wasn't for a long enough period to to sort of make a conclusive statement of what sort of life would be with no contrails, but yeah yeah we sort of ran that experiment the hard way. So I, I got one question: Is it useful at all? Imagine you had moderate opacity measure so measurements of stars. Mm -hmm. of wavelength-dependent transmission to the stars taken every night, multiple times per night. So you're basically mapping the sky every night at some relatively low cadence. Right. Is that useful? So you kind of get measurements over the entire sky. You maybe get five different wavelength points. So what mostly determines that variability, sort of low, low altitude? No, no, this is a telescope that's going to be doing this, right? So it's going to be oh, okay. the whole sky okay. every night for years in multiple wavelengths. Tons of data because there's many stars. Right. And you'll hit them over and over again, so you'll be able to do time variability. Right. And you'll right. Do 15 second shots, so you have like two 15 second shots, um, and then come back again 15 minutes later. So, 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 so what do you? You can back out detailed sort of measurements of the sort of column cloud or column. Uh, Col question, column useful? transmissivity, right? Yeah, is it useful for so, compared to satellite data because it'll be relatively low opacity situations? So I won't say no, but but no, <laughs> okay. um, no, no, just because. Fine. So it makes lives easier, so so, I mean, so so the the clear sky radiation problem. I won't say it's solved, but this is one of the sort of early successes of the DOE arm sort of mission was to make sure everybody's sort of radiation codes in the climate models. They work really well for clear sky radiation, and they've been tested against line-by-line -line codes. And, I'm thinking and, up to 20% opacity, so it could even be moderate, like light slips. You can ooh, OK. So that, that sort of might be useful in that, but, but I'm, I'm trying to think if that would give you anything more than what the satellites exactly measure, this, yeah. measure already. I mean, what I would think they could, that could do is you could somehow use that information probably to tune the current satellite retrievals Okay. That that to that to, to that we use to get sort of crystal like effective radius and things like that. Okay. So that could, could be yeah, it could be could be of use. So. Yeah. I mean, you um, talked about the ship uh, trails, mm -hmm. but in the world there are some tremendously dense regions of ships. And there are other places where there are very few ships. So from those, yeah, where the, on those shipping lanes, can you? Mm -hmm. Can you actually measure the effects? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I don't know the number off the off the top of my off the top of my head. I think John was sort of wanting a sort of back of the envelope kind of calculation for some of these things, but I don't know that off the top of my head. But yeah, there there are sometimes. I mean, off the western coasts of of particularly North America and the North Atlantic, there are quite a few ships. I mean, lots of ship trails. And yeah, you could go probably find times where there were ship trails versus no ship trails, and and kind of. So, sort of try to back out the, the, the sort of influence of, of those. Yeah, that's probably doable. Okay, so. that's great. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks. Thanks.